You're listening to the Higher Calling Podcast, your source for all things hiring, staffing, and recruiting. I'm Pete Newsom, joined by Ricky Baez, of course. Ricky, how are you today? I am doing great, Pete. How about you? I'm doing all right, man. It's it's Florida. It's hot. It's summer. Doing okay, though. How are you? Yeah. It, it, it's yes, it is summer, and uh, I can't think of any better way to spend my summer than inside in an air conditioned office reading resumes. To repeat, reading resumes. <laughs> so that is what today is all about: how mm -hmm. to quickly identify potential in a resume. But I think uh, it's hard to read resumes effectively, thoroughly, and quickly. Don't you agree? Um. It is. It is really hard when a recruiter has hundreds of other positions to to recruit for, right? And it's and it's a balance. It's a balance of how much time do you give one resume versus um, the quantity of resumes you have to read an entire day. So you got to find that that perfect balance. And I think that's what we're talking about today, right? It is how yeah. how to uh, make the most out of interpreting resumes. And there's a not all jobs are alike. We know that some have very high volume uh, applicants. Mm -hmm. I see those on LinkedIn. You, yeah, there's posts that have a thousand people who apply. Oh, wow. If you're that recruiter, you're going to have a very hard time giving each resume the attention it's probably due. And then there's other jobs that have uh, very few applications mm -hmm. or candidates are hard to come by because the candidate pool is small. So we know that it is nearly impossible. It is impossible to be too general and and, yeah. and also accurate in a discussion like this, but let's aim for the middle and, and talk about you know, most positions, which probably have a fair number of resumes to look through uh, by the recruiter, but yeah. also need to be efficient in doing so. You just can't spend a lot of time. You can get lost in resumes. So, so let, let's explain that because I've, I've had a conversation with a lot of people who are not in HR, who don't understand that concept. They've been in, in, in conferences where it says a recruiter has a really small amount of time to, to scan a resume. So people ask, why would a recruiter not give enough time to a resume to make sure they're, hot, they're looking for the right person? Again, it's time. You and I were talking before we uh, we uh, we started uh, recording that there's a lot of work and not enough time, and that's a great problem to have. <laughs> well, but right? it is a problem, right? Yeah. And if you don't have a solution for it, it remains a problem. And candidates don't necessarily understand the volume that's associated. They, they I mean, of course, they 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 stopped and thought about it and looked at the number of applications. Yeah. What candidates. What I see candidates becoming frustrated with is uh, um, unresponsiveness, and mm. it's just not practical for most recruiters, busy recruiters, to um, to dive too deeply, right? And I don't, I don't yeah. think we want them to. So we want them to not miss great candidates, not miss qualified individuals, but we also don't want them to linger. So yeah. let's talk about. Well, look, if we were giving advice to candidates right now, I'll say, treat your resume like a magazine that you'd see in the checkout line or a newspaper, if, if those things still exist, where you have to grab the reader's attention with the headline and you have to give them a reason to want more. So it's marketing 101. And, and that's what people probably struggle with as much as anything. That's why the resume writing industry is so prevalent, and it, it, which always surprises me because all these resources are available online, but nonetheless, people need that extra help and, and certainly want it at times, but you have to toot your own horn. And so that's what we're looking for as a recruiter. When you open a resume is I need that attention grabbing headline to make me continue. Otherwise I'm, I'm moving on. I'm grabbing the pack of gum and not, not picking up the magazine. You each have a packet of gum. So Ringley spearmint gum. The one that lasts like 20 seconds. <laughs> you know, I, I don't, I haven't been chewing gum lately. I need to, I don't even know what's on the market. I'm going to go buy one today fan back in the day, but I don't know if that still, that still exists. Awesome. Um, no, look, it, it's and Pete. Here's the thing. It, it's you have to, the big question now becomes, all right, what is that headline? What should I put out there to make my resume stand out? And there's, there's no one answer for that, right? Cause it really depends on who you are. It depends on what kind of position you are you are applying for in the culture of the organization, 
right? If you do your homework or research the organization, who they are, the cultural values, you'll be able to get a good sense of what kind of a resume strategy you're going to put together to really grab the, uh, their attention. And make no mistake, folks, the candidate that spends the time to research and home and, and does the homework for that company, that person is going to have a much better chance to have the resume picked up and get a call back from a recruiter. And, and so I'm, I'm glad you make that point because if you are a recruiter and trying to determine with very little information at your disposal, mm -hmm. who to invest more time in the one that's clearly taken an, uh, the opportunity and made the effort to customize their resume for your job, and I'll just say it because I have to even writes a cover letter. We'll, we'll move on <laughs> from that. Right. But that's a candidate. If, if I know nothing else, I know that they've uh, showed a certain level of motivation and interest and right. they haven't just clicked blindly uh, going down a, a long list of, of job titles. So that's, that's a great thing. If someone has, uh, has, has highlighted their experience and tailored it for your job, Stop and pay a little closer attention That's right. because of the first step in all this is, look, you're trying to do two things. You're trying to rule in the right ones and rule out the bad ones. So we'll talk about red flags a, a little bit later, but let's find the ones that have relevant experience. Mm -hmm. And I will say, as someone who's looked at hundreds of thousands, if not millions of resumes at this point, it might be millions, that you don't want to have to figure out what you're looking at, right? That, yeah. I mean, it has to tell a clean, clear, concise story and it has to jump off the page at me. So first thing I'm looking for is, does this person have relevant experience? And if that jumps out at me, then, then I'll go to step two. So Pete, I got to tell you, from a former recruiter's perspective, nothing, and, and, and this is for all the recruiters out there and also for all the candidates out there looking for a job to give you a glimpse inside a recruiter's mind. Nothing annoys me more and nothing gets under my skin more than I'm going through a resume and it has absolutely nothing to do with the position that they apply for, like nothing to do. And Look, a recruiter spends an average of nine seconds to look at a resume, right? And if I look at a resume, it has nothing to do. That's just nine seconds that was just wasted out of my life that I'm not going to get back. I'm just being honest. That's right? right. So, well, okay. So that's on the candidates to to set that stage yeah. and we'll, we'll address them separately mm -hmm. in, a, in okay. a different gotcha. show. How to say it. Sorry. That's right. So if I'm, the, so you're, so you're this recruiter, what are you looking for? Well, you're looking for the history, right? Mm -hmm. Professionally, you're looking for key criteria. That's how I think of every matching every job description with every candidate. I want to know, and if I'm recruiting on the job, I will know the key hiring criteria. So that's what I'm looking for initially. Mm -hmm. Most jobs that we end up recruiting for in the professional world, we're not looking for education and, and certifications per se. We're looking at skills and experience as the way I like to think of it is what you've done in the past is a really good indication of what you'll be yeah. able to do for me in the future. So that's, that's always the, the lens with which I look at a resume. So I'm, I want the skills. I want the work history. That's, that's where I go. What, what about you? Do you, do you differ? Oh, no, no, no. I don't differ. That's why I kind of perked up because I love what you just said there. You don't just look for certifications in education, although that's important. Right. Because all a college degree is, and I'm just going to, you know, just, just to say it, it's a receipt that you got an education. I'm not looking on whether you got an education or not. I'm looking to see how you're using it. So on a resume as a recruiter, what I look for is examples of what you're doing with that education and certification you got. I want to see tangible examples that I can see as a recruiter that that could be valuable to the organization. The recruiter is an expert. They know what the job description is, is, is like. So we're looking something to fulfill those needs for that job description. So always put down, well, from the candidate's perspective, always put down um, how you're using it from a recruiter's perspective. Do not let do not let do, do not get carried away by the shiny um of school, right? If you see they graduated from Harvard, you're like, oh my God, I'm gonna bring this person in. Well, no, take a deeper look. If they got a humanities degree from Harvard, that's not what Harvard is known for. 
Right? Well, uh, if they're, if they're a Harvard grad, right? I might bring them in anyway. But uh, <laughs> the if most schools, to your point, become increasingly less important as your yeah. as, as a candidate's career evolves. We we all know yeah. that. Uh, depending on the 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 skill set, the position type, some degrees are going to be more relevant than others. There's many mm-hmm. professions today where a college degree would have been mandatory in the not so distant That's past. True. 20 years ago. I mean, I worked for a large company uh, earlier in my career that would not promote people above a manager level unless they had um, a master's degree, which I found absurd then. I find even more absurd now. Um, Bad choice. (laughs) Bad. That's a bad line to draw in the sand. But nonetheless, (laughs) every organization has the the ability to do that because your, your goal in this is to find the best candidate for that particular job. And as someone's career progresses, as they're able to accomplish and do more for you, potentially, yeah. the degree that they have is probably not going to be the biggest indication of, of how effective they'll be, but everyone needs to figure that out for themselves. So if your organization does happen to value degrees greater than most, to a degree greater than most, then of course you're going to highlight that. But for the most part, for, for me I, I need to see the skills, right? I need to know they're capable of doing the job, number one. And then I'm going to look at the work history. And that is where uh, you want to see a clear path to understand what it is. And I think of it and often describe of this section as um, as as driving down a busy street, right? For me in Orlando, it's it's Orange Avenue, right through the heart of oh. downtown. I mean, yeah. If you start hitting lights, it feels like you're going to hit every light. Yep. But if it's all green, man, you can sail through and uh, it's a beautiful thing. So that's how I want to see a resume. I don't want to have to understand why there's overlapping dates on job history. If I, <laughs> I mean, to me, that is one of the biggest red flags and and something that I've seen more of our more time spent among our recruiters over the years trying to justify, explain, understand yeah. It's 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 something that just ju- always jumps off the page at me, and I I'm out if I see um, <laughs> if I can't follow the career path. So that's an important piece there, right? It, it's uh it's because it's as a recruiter, I I'm looking I'm looking to fulfill this position as easy as possible, as efficient as possible. Because once I'm done with this one, I have ninety nine thousand other ones that I have to do. So what I look for as a recruiter is for all the information to be there, readily accessible as quickly as possible, that I can read within nine seconds and then make a decision from there on forward. So for everybody out there listening from a candidate's perspective, because I know we're talking about the recruiter's perspective, uh, it's like, what? Hey, I'm looking at both sides of it, man. I got to look at both sides because you got to understand. Here I am bringing military logic. You got to understand the enemy in order for you to understand the war, which which the candidates most definitely are not. Are not the enemy. (laughs) They definitely are not the enemy. But I guess what I'm saying is, especially for the recruiters out there, is as soon as you get your system down. Right. You've got to get your system down for you to balance how much time you look at a resume versus what you have to do later on. So you got to come up with your own system. And what I would do as a recruiter, that way you connect better with your candidates is you do a little re- um, a little video about that system and put it on social media, put it on LinkedIn. That way you let everybody know it makes it easier for you. Would you not believe? Yeah. Would you so, not think that right, would work? So I'm, I'm going to share what may be an unpopular opinion. OK as I'm prone to do, but I, maybe it won't be. I, I don't know. Okay. But here's here's my my strong belief that most people are bad at writing resumes. Okay. Why? I would agree with that. Why are they bad? Because they don't do it very often, right? They're not in the business of reading resumes as we're talking about. They're not in the business of interpreting resumes or or deciding whether it's candidate A or candidate B who you're going to move forward in the job. They're good at doing their job, right? They're good as as a teacher or a, or a or a doctor or a software developer or a or a designer, whatever their role might be. None of which has to do with writing resumes. So yeah. recruiters need to acknowledge that, it, it, in at least internally, and mm-hmm. look at resumes. I'll say it again through that lens, mm-hmm. because. But that, but that's not what I'm looking for. And so it, when when people go to resume writers, 
they're looking for something that's to me doesn't really make the difference in whether they'll be selected. Now the resume writers, of course, will share their success stories, but mm -hmm. these candidates were probably going to get hired anyway, right? It just so happens <laughs> to be. I, I'm sure they don't share their stories of 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 candidates who didn't get hired. Yeah. But it's not because your resume was great, but you can rule rule yourself out by having a bad resume. And that's what I'm mm. talking about when I think of conflicting uh, dates on your job. That doesn't take someone who is a great resume writer. That just takes someone whose career makes sense, mm. right? And so yeah. if it, it, it either tells a, a good story or a bad one. So don't, don't get hung up on you know, looking for a great resume or people get upset that there was a typo or bad grammar, you know what, go, go talk to the 10 people in your life you're closest to. And depending on who you are, <laughs> I, I would venture to guess that their grammar is not excellent. So, Have them so write emails. I bet it's not great. Now, should, should, does it show that a candidate takes time to, to, to spell check things and to have someone proofread? Of course you can get into all that, but don't get hung up on things like formatting, or phrasing, people generally are not good at that. And we know it. And so it, 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 I just think we tend to get confused as to what we're actually looking for in a resume at times, which um, you know, is, is, is a bad path to go down. I may be on the opposite uh, side of that, Pete, because, you know, from, from a recruiter's perspective, now I get, I get about formatting. I completely understand because that's just, okay, where, where the words are on the resume, right? If I see a grammatical error, if I see a spelling error on a resume, it's a huge red flag for me. And I understand that people hardly write resumes. I completely understand. But this is the one piece of document where they're supposed to be putting their best foot forward. And if this is the level of care that I see in the best foot forward, imagine when they're comfortable at work. Now, the opposite is also true. What I was saying about, uh, actually, you were saying it, that a recruiter would give more time to that person who took the time to craft that personalized resume to the organization. Now, that's a person that when I hire, if I hire, if they do well, that's a person that I know. They've showed me that they're going to take that kind of level of care in anything they do. So the nonverbal cues is just as important as a verbal one, wouldn't you think? Yeah, I mean, look, it's inexcusable to not use spell check. Yeah. Or, or something like that. What I'm really referring to are just general grammar uh, problems that, that that people will have, or bad phrasing, or like you said, formatting, or or the way the the headers look. Those are things that um, really don't have much bearing on a software developer's ability to write great code Agreed. and to operate efficiently and to be a good uh, teammate and whatever is important for that particular role. But look at their skills, look at their work history, mm -hmm. look at longevity, right? Not Let's so popular today either. We want to act like that doesn't matter, but here's why it does. Because it shows you've had the ability to deal with challenging times and adversity. If, if When I see a resume of someone who's only worked at, at all their jobs a very short time, it tells me they haven't had to deal with or successfully deal with too many challenges because we all get the honeymoon phase. Right. Yep. You, you're in, you're new. Right. You get this grace period, you're, you're training, whatever. But when I see people who've consistently left after a year and a half, I think hmm, you, you haven't really gotten gotten through the the muck at all and That's come out clean on the other half. side. That's the uh, the uh, threshold. A year and a half to you is short. It is short. OK, sure. Yeah. Well, it. it I need to see that you've been able to stick it out some at some point, right? That's what, yeah. because I, other or I have to be, it's okay to do this too. If, if you're okay with someone probably not lasting very long, but again, th this is, this is something that I have, to, when I have to make decisions out of 200 resumes, potentially, yeah. it, who do you think I want to go with? Do I want to go with the one who's never worked for a job more than a year and a half? When I've just told you, I think the first year almost is a grace period in many companies, right? 
or do I want to see someone that's had a history of success and advancement? Because I'm sense. also looking for that. I, I want to mm -hmm. see that you've succeeded where you were previously. As I said um, earlier in the show, what you've done in the past is the best indicator of what you'll be able to do for me in the future. Right. right. So if what you've done is not accomplished much of significance anywhere you've been, okay, that's what I'm going with because I don't know anything else about you. Yeah. And, and and I agree with that. I do. You know, it, it's a you have from a recruiter's perspective, you have to take a look at that, that, that past experience. But Pete, you know, some people because you're right, some people are horrible at at writing resumes. Not a bad thing. It's just that they haven't had that practice. And then other people could be great at writing. They're just not good at at, you know, patting themselves on the back. And that's what a resume is. It is a walking, talking, it's magazine cover, exactly how you said, right? So, but here's my thing. Here's my thing for, from, from a recruiter's point of view. Job hopping today, job hopping today doesn't really strike me as bad as it did 20 years ago. And the reason for that is, is because I understand from a recruiter, I understand today's workforce, they're not as attached and loyal to a company like their predecessors have. Would you, would you not agree with that? I do, it, but it's about showing accomplishment. So it's a good segue into that next thing to look for is, is data. That mm. is, I want to see tangible evidence that you've been successful in your role. Mm -hmm. If you're a software developer, tell me what you've built. If you're a designer, show me what you've, what you've developed or designed. If you're a salesperson, tell me what you've sold. Give me metrics. Give me numbers. That's give right. me the data that I need to see. So when you've been, if I'm hiring a salesperson, if I'm hiring a recruiter, we'll say, since that's who we're talking to, and I see that you've worked at a string of places for never more than a, a year and a half, well, how do I... How good of a recruiter can you be for that company <laughs> I get that. Um, where you haven't been through multiple cycles? And, uh, you know, I don't, and especially if your job, I, I'll say this too, and this is a, like the third thing I'll say that's probably going to be unpopular in some circles, like you said, in, in today's times is that um, I don't, I, if I see just linear uh, or, or just, if I've seen your progression stay flat and you're going from recruiter to recruiter to recruiter to recruiter jobs, you're not advancing, right? So maybe they don't want to advance. Well, then, the, then again, here's what we're talking about. We're talking mm -hmm. about a resume being the book cover, the magazine cover that's going to determine whether someone will pick it up to read it. Okay. And if I have five resumes that I'm looking at, even though we know we have hundreds Mm -hmm. And I have a choice between year and a half job hoppers, or I ha I look at someone who's been at their uh, places, uh, previous employers for three years, five years, demonstrable okay. progression on their resume. I see metrics. I see awards. I see recognition and accolades. Who are you picking? Who are you picking? I'm with you. I know, and I, you I, who yeah. is everyone going to pick? Yeah. No, so right. that is the problem in, with this. And it, and this is more of a societal point, right? And I, I rolled my eyes at you when you were talking about, you know, here's a message for, for candidates. <laughs> well, it is a message for candidates, but anyone in um, who's, who has to make hiring decisions is that if you don't know anything else about the person coming in, and you're going to compare what you what you what you see to others. You're always going to want to go with the ones who seem to have more longevity and progression in their career. It's just it's just smart. Why would you do anything differently? No, so I, it's not that I would do anything differently. I'm just looking at the opposite concept as well. So job hopping, yes, if somebody jumps around a lot, that's a red flag. But if somebody stuck around for an organization for 30 years, and that's the only organization they know, wouldn't that limit how they work in different industries? Because all they know is that one company. Sure. They may know it, their it, job, but they only know their company's way of performing that job. It would. And so if you see someone who's job hopped a lot, and let's just continue this fictitious year and a half <laughs> scenario, but I do, yeah. it's not that fictitious, right? We see it all yeah. the time. Um, that 
and by the way, those are usually the people giving the most career advice out there, just for the on LinkedIn for for the record. And I guess they're good at finding jobs, but I think I want people who are good at at keeping and succeeding keeping in, in their yep. jobs. Um, but if you you have to make a decision, do you want someone who can hit the ground running quickly because that's what you're going to interpret mm-hmm. from from that, or do you say, hmm, I don't see any um, demonstration of of success or achievement. That's mm-hmm. how I see it. So I'm just going to play the odds. And if I see someone with that's been at a company for 30 years, it depends on what I want them to want them to do. Yeah. Do I need that level of deep knowledge and expertise that I'm sure they would come with? Yes. Maybe I'll then I'll hire them. Do I need someone to hit the ground running quickly and be agile and flexible? No, probably not. So the situation and the need will dictate how I interpret longevity at a job. But this is more of a general statement that um, I want to see accomplishments and I want to mm-hmm. see progression. And you said, what if someone doesn't want to move up? Okay, well, I, depending on the role, that may <laughs> yeah. not be the person I want to hire. Okay. Right? Do I want to hire? So what you just asked me, the way I heard it was, do you want to hire someone with ambition or without? Well, I mean, but you've you've answered it correctly. It depends on the job. Right. right. If if you're looking for somebody who just, you know, just make widgets and that's it. When you're looking for any kind of ambition, this position doesn't necessarily move up and you don't want to move up. Match made in heaven. Match and then sometimes that works yeah. against candidates. Right. I mean, where they'll say, whoa, I'm afraid they're not going to be in this job too long. I'm afraid they're too yes. ambitious and yes. want to move on. I mean, I've received yeah. that feedback a lot over the years yeah. uh, from from companies that that want the, 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 the person to stay in the same seat. Now, the same problem exists, so right. If you're going to job you appreciate hop anyway, that, though? you're not. Then you you're appreciate not, you're not going to be able to rely on that. Hmm? Then you appreciate that, though. Um, yeah, I depend again right? depending on the role. Yeah. Do I want that in a salesperson? No. Yeah. No, definitely not. Do I want it in um, an accountant? Sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if that's so, if that's if if that's all I ever want or expect from them, sure. But to your point, every job and situation is unique. It is. And, you know, and, and yes, so a lot of job hopping within a small amount of time is a red flag. Staying in one company for a long time could be a red flag, depending on how you want to do it. What about employment gaps? How do you see those? Um, Again, it's, it's, if we're being completely transparent as we always are, it depends on what I'm comparing it to. Yeah. Is it a small a candidate field, then I'll be more forgiving of all of these things that we're talking about. If it's an abundant pool of candidates, well, who am I going to yeah. go with? The one yeah. that's shown consistency? <laughs> because you have to either accept or not. And I'm okay if the answer is not. It's just, it's not how how I would operate and have operated successfully, I'll say, as a recruiter over a long time. But if I don't have anything else to operate on, I'm going to make some assumptions based on yeah. what you're showing me on the on, on the cover of this book. So if I see a, a work history that's hard to follow or inconsistent or big gaps, I don't know. Do I have time to stop and address that? You you, you said it earlier, nine seconds per resume. Nine seconds on average. Yep. So how much of it's getting consumed with understanding why there's a three-year gap? I, I mean... Right. <laughs> well, I mean, here's the thing, right? To me, if uh, that that nine seconds, it's uh, it's spent on what they write on their summary, right? Here's my skills. Here's what I do. Blah blah blah. And then I'm like, I'll move on to the next. Sometimes I don't get enough. I mean, or, or if I'm trying to put too many things together, I'm done with the resume. Well, you, you can use this analogy. It's it's, just, it's analogous to so many things that exist in the world. I was looking for uh, for something at the mall last weekend with my wife, looking for a, a, a shirt for a very specific purpose. I went to the rack, I scrolled through with my eyes, found one I liked and then picked it out. Why? I don't know, because that's the one that caught my attention. It was the right color. It appeared to be the right fabric, you know, the brand, whatever it is. Then I go to the next level, right? Here are three shirts I'm going to try on, right? It's just like three resumes I'm picking out. But that means you didn't pick out every other shirt or every other resume. So why are you picking out those and not others? Because they hit all the right points. Clearly stating 
the, the, the qualifications, the work history, the experience, the data, the awards, the maybe longevity, yeah. right? But as much as anything else, you're not throwing a lot of other garbage at me. Um, and so if I see a shirt, you know, if it's, um, I'm like, I, if, if, if it's so off from what I'm looking at, right. If I'm looking for a, a, a winter shirt and I see one with short sleeves, I'm moving on. Right. I don't have to dwell on why it has short sleeves or understand what happened in its evolution to end up with short sleeves. It's just not what I want. He, I'm just, I'm just glad that I'm not the only one who attacks a mall that way. I hate malls. And I think our wives should be on this show with us <laughs> because my wife goes in with a strategy. She's there for eight hours. I go in, I go into the mall to find what I want exactly how I look at a resume. Well, we went, I'll scan for nine seconds. <laughs> right. We went, I said, Hey, I need to go. I need this shirt. I, I need it for a reason. She's like, great. I'll go. She jumped at the chance to go with me. Of course. And 10 minutes in, I'm like, all right, I'm already over this. Like, well, we just got here. I'm like, well, I don't know. I, I just want the I'm shirt. The same way. Just like I want the candidate. I don't yeah. want to look at resumes unnecessarily. I want to get right to the point. So the more tailored, the more specific, the more relevant, um, and the more easy to understand and give me the feeling that you're worth more than those nine seconds. That's the yeah. goal. And so we could justify anything and, and there's lots of reasons. Now, here's the thing. And this is now I'll speak to a candidate and say, if you have a resume that is not easy to interpret or you see potential red flags, whether mm -hmm. you think there should be a red flag or not, right? And whether you're justified and there's lots of reasons. And I fully acknowledge that some great, great employees probably have an awful looking work history. Then you're going to have to figure out another way in the door. Mm -hmm. Right. Don't don't mm -hmm. compare. Don't send your resumes into a pile where where a bunch of others are going to look good. Figure out something creative, work with a recruiter. And by the way, I know all of these things because as the owner of a staffing company for two decades, our recruiters are constantly having to figure out gaps in resumes, yep. understand things that on the surface are don't make a lot of sense. Fix formatting. And this is it, which which drives them crazy. So we know all these things and um, they're not insurmountable, but it does make you at a harder hill to climb. So it's, so we talked about the, the, the hopping, we talked about um, what kind of information to put on the, how many red flags, but Pete, are you good in figuring out if somebody's exaggerating their stuff on an, on, on a resume or not? Well, I assume everyone does, right? I mean, to some ah. degree. Most will exaggerate, um, but I don't, I, you know, that's an interesting one. What, what's your take on that? I don't, I mean, exact there's exaggerating and then there's, there's being dishonest. Are we, are you separating those things? What's the, okay. So, okay. So let's split hairs here, right? So exaggerating to some point does dabble in dishonesty. Because if you're exaggerating what you can do, you're painting a false picture to somebody else about your credentials, is it not? Yep, it does. Um, so okay. we'll give me an example, though, right? I'm the greatest recruiter in the world. Are we talking in a, a um, you know subjective exaggeration, or I filled a million positions in a week? <laughs> okay, now that's not an exaggeration; that's dishonest. So I think. I I think it depends. I, I think that you find those things out. Now, once it's on the resume and you see something extraordinary jump out, because that, that's what that's what will happen, right? You'll you'll see things that either are potentially too good to be true or they're amazing and you want to drill deeper, or things that are potential concerns that you need to drill into. So that's on the candidate to defend. Mm -hmm. And that I don't know that I can pick those things out just from the resume itself. Uh, uh, without drilling down further and do a conversation. This is one of those things that I don't know what I'm looking for, but when I see it, I know it. There you go. Be yeah, because because once I've seen situations that I'm like, whoa, there's no way. And that comes with experience, right? I know how a sales call center works. I know how a government entity works. So a recruiter that comes from there in an environment that, I'm mean, sorry, let's say I'm looking for a recruiter. Right. I'm a recruiter looking for a recruiter. And then I know they're coming from a government agency. I know that a, rec a recruiter at a local government maybe recruits 50 positions a month. 
and they're telling me I fill successfully fill 600 positions every month. That's a huge, that's not a red flag. That's a red blanket. Right. right. And now I'm going to have a conversation. And actually, I'm not going to have a conversation. I'm not because I know. Actually, it depends. I'm thinking out loud here. If it's too exaggerated, I'm not even going to give him a call. But if it's like, wow, this is a little bit more than normal. You've now given me the 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 need or the want to follow up with you. So maybe a little exaggeration is good. Well, I I I don't know about that. Uh, I, I, okay. I don't right. see that. You you think that maybe that it would be more common than it is. Um, yeah. but I I think people are used to having to defend what's on their resume and are careful mm. to put things in writing that are blatant untruths. So um I don't but I but I agree with you. If you know have intimate knowledge of the role and know what a, a too good to be true looks like, mm -hmm. right? Filled 600 positions in a week by myself. Okay. I know that's not true. Why would I, I don't think that's someone you'd screw around with. Uh, you don't. I mean, if you do, you ask him to uh, you just come to the interview with a bunch of water and say, do your magic. Let me see some wine out of this. <laughs> there, there you go. Um, so, you know, I, I what what about reading resume? I mean, so any any other tips that, that we have uh, uh, that you'd want to offer to someone who how how they should approach? I feel like I've given some of mine today. Mm -hmm. um, that I want to be as efficient as possible and get to the. I want to get to the finish line, just like I wanted the shirt. Right. The goal was to get the shirt, the best shirt, and the with the littlest effort. And and I think that's how every recruiter intends to operate. Whether they do or not is is a different question. But everyone wants the best candidate as quickly and efficiently as possible. So how do we get there? So how do we get there? Um, I know this was something that I struggled with when I was a recruiter. And what I struggle with is finding that balance of spending enough time because I know how much time I put in my resume, right? When I was in college, I knew uh, um, a pro my professor didn't read my papers. So that's when now as a professor, I read papers. So as a recruiter, I try to find, I try to give every candidate the the most time possible. But at the end of the day, it's almost impossible to do that because you as a recruiter have a responsibility. You have a, 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 a job to do to find that candidate every day that that position is empty, it's more money the organization loses. And that's the hat you need to have. So for me, what I like to do, I organize myself. I, I study that job description like nobody's business. And I mean, study it to the point that I almost know it by heart. If you study that job description, you test yourself to, you know, to, to, to know what's in it, you will be a whiz at reading resumes faster to make a determination on whether that job, that candidate should be given an opportunity to interview. But I've seen a lot of recruiters who just jump in, they skim, they spend as, as much time on the, on the uh, job description as a resume. And that's a mistake. Well, the, the so job descriptions uh, have sort of, evolved in a way I think that, that have led to that because mm -hmm. recruiters know that they often don't accurately represent the, the true hiring true need. Yeah. Um, that you know, job descriptions are its own discussion on the good and bad. I think, I think to your point, while most, I said, most people are bad at resume writing, most are bad at job description writing too, but <laughs> yeah. they don't have to be, they just, no one likes to do it. No, it's yeah. a bad, you know, no one, that's not fun. Let's get past that. Let's just get the candidate. So get, get the right job description in place. You'll, you'll have more accuracy in your applicants and the resumes that you receive. But as a recruiter, I want to understand what the most relevant parts are to that. And then match those up with the resumes that I'm looking for and to fill the job with as few candidate interviews as possible. And Ooh. that's an area where, I think people get lost too. So maybe my philosophy is what leads me to being harsh about some things like um, gaps in resumes or job hopping, where I am just trying to get to the candidate who is going to get the job and be the best one available. So that means I want to rule out, I will be faster to rule people out than I will to rule them in. 
as a result. And that's one of Ooh, you know, my okay. strongest recruiting yeah. beliefs, right? If you is to rule out all the bad and then you're only left with good. Yeah. Right. So now if it's a skill set where there's only five people within a thousand mile radius that can do the job, I'm going to be more accommodating. But if it's a big candidate pool, like we talked about earlier, you don't get a second chance, you right? Don't. Yeah, you know. And 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 look, here's the thing: from from a a career progression perspective, this is to the recruiters. From a career progression perspective, if I'm overseeing a recruiter, and I got two recruiters, right? One of them is taking their time to fill this position. They have a lot of interviews because to schedule interviews, you take time away from leadership and hiring authorities from their regular jobs to interview. I, I, who do I pick? for promotion will be the person who fully understands the entire business picture. Because what you just said there, Pete, is crucial. You want to fill that position with as little interviews as possible. More interviews equals more productivity loss equals more money loss. That's right. what that means. And a recruiter who understands that and finds a way how to be more efficient in bringing those in, the higher ups are going to notice that. So, Again, find the most efficient way. I can tell you the best way. Again, for me, it's a job description. I know you said sometimes they're old, but whenever I see it, whenever a recruiter tells me this is old, excellent. Let me connect you with my HR generalist. We're going to go ahead and get that updated ASAP. We should not put that to the side, <laughs> right? Right. So, yeah. Well, no, yeah, I, so, I know, no, and I, I think um, on most most of the time, the vast majority of the time, there's there's about three to five things that really, really matter for a job. Okay. And, that, and, that, and that's, this is a kind of a very broad, gross exaggeration perhaps, but that's usually how, what I'm looking for is, let me start with those things. And those things have to be abundantly evident to me on the resume. The rest of the things need to be in, in place where I'm not um, concerned about drama coming in from the candidate. And mm -hmm. yeah, and could, yeah, just let's, let's make it smooth and easy. And I can tell you unequivocally that throughout the thousands and thousands of people we've recruited in place successfully over the years, there's been um, many more that we haven't uh, successfully placed that we've recruited. And through all of all of those experiences, one what's become clear to me is with there one red flag may as well be a hundred. So if, <laughs> if we're new together as a candidate, I'm the recruiter. You know, you're the candidate. I'm the recruiter. And early on in my relationship with you, there's a there's a flaw or a problem jumping out. Why would I want to invest more time and effort right, in yep. that? So I'm looking for red flags, right? Because I I know what if you can do if you if you're a Drupal developer, if you're an interior designer, I will know. I need to make sure that you are a good Drupal developer, right? I need to know that if you if your design style and experience and capabilities match. The, the client's needs. But I don't know if there's a lot of other baggage and problems that are coming are coming with you. So that's what I'm going to try to rule out first. Right. I'm gonna rule out all the bad and then that, and then be left with the good. That makes sense. That it and and that that brings me to this next point then, Pete, because if if I've seen situations where a recruiter is looking for that diamond in the rough, looking for that unicorn, right? And they find that unicorn, but that unicorn also has red flags. When you find that diamond in the rough and the unicorn, sometimes that diminishes or devalues the value of a red flag to the point that some recruiters ignore it. And then six months later, they're like, oh man, well, we knew this at the uh, interview because the other quality you was looking for overshadowed that red flag. So what I'm saying here is do not lower your standards from red flags just because you see somebody come with a skill set that is a hundred percent that, that is what you're looking for. So we got to be careful with that as human beings and recruiters. In fact, I'm putting together a book right now on, on this and I've, I've started, started thinking a little bit about what the title will be. And it is going to have to, it's, it'll end up being something about ruling people out. Right. Because okay. you know, recruiters want to find the right candidate. Yes, of course. But we have to be equally focused on excluding the wrong ones, if not that's, more focused oh, on that. There it is. And that's and that's where new recruiters struggle the most is looking. You you, you don't want to see the red flag. So you don't see them. That's you right. should go into that uh, can, new candidate uh, resume conversation 
as soon as possible. If there are red flags, you want to know them immediately. So back to the resume point, if you can identify a red flag in those first nine seconds, great. You don't have to invest 10 seconds. That's a win. If you don't ident identify it in those first nine seconds with the resume and you go deeper, well, hopefully you can identify it before you pick up the phone and schedule a call. If not, then, then the first conversation and so on. So what you don't want to do is find out after the person's been hired that there was an oops. This is why they had the gap on the resume. This is why they don't stay anywhere very long. So play the odds because we have limited time. And the odds indicate that the cleaner and more straightforward a resume is, the better the candidate process is going to go and they're going to be a better a better hire. I, it's, I don't have anything else to add to that because you're 100% spot on there, Pete. Well, then let's say goodbye. <laughs> that's not how I meant it. <laughs> I think, I think, I think that's good. You always yeah. get the close. Can I, is that the last Sorry. word? Are we going to call it, call it good? <laughs> last <All right>. word. <laughs> awesome. Well, this was good. Uh, Ricky, thank you so much. Hopefully we've shed some light on resume reading and some things to consider. We love feedback. So Hit us up, higher calling, H I R E C A L L I N G, at fourcornerresources.com. We love feedback. If you have suggestions or just say you think we're wrong uh, and you want to you share why, we'll be happy to address that on the air too. So, Ricky, thanks so much. Thank you, sir. You have a good one. You did a great job spelling that, by the way, because I'm like H I R. So, yeah, you, you got it. All right, folks, have a good one. Good night. Have a good rest of the day.